After Tarentum fell to the Romans, Hannibal established his winter quarters at Metapontum. Despite the setback at Tarentum, the Romans kept their distance from Hannibal, but maintained a watchful eye. Hannibal still remained master of the field and kept up constant foraging operations to keep his army well supplied. The two most significant cities Hannibal possessed in Italy were Metapontum and Heraclea. He also maintained control over Brutium. This was the last province that Hannibal held in its entirety. After the fall of Tarentum, it was even more important to prevent a Roman capture of Brutium. Meanwhile, in Iberia, Scipio spent the winter winning over the various tribes in the peninsula. Scipio was intent on maintaining the momentum after his victory at New Carthage. Iberia, which just a few years ago had seemed firmly in control of the Carthaginians, was suddenly in danger of falling to the Romans. Tribe after tribe began to switch their loyalties from Carthage to Rome. Many Iberians simply left their posts at Hasdrubal's camp and arrived at Rome's headquarters in Taraco. Scipio also met with Indibilis and Mandonius. They were the chieftains of one of the most powerful tribes in Iberia. They previously had remained loyal to Carthage. The Carthaginians rewarded their loyalty by returning many of their tribal territories after the death of the two Scipio brothers in 211 BC. However, the chieftains soon began to have second thoughts. Polybius writes, quote, Indibilis and Mandonius were at this time two of the greatest princes in Iberia, and were supposed to be the most trustworthy adherents of Carthage. But since they had long been disaffected and were watching for an opportunity of revolt, ever since Hasdrubal Gisco, on the pretext that he mistrusted them, had demanded from them the payment of a large sum of money and the surrender of their wives and daughters as hostages, end quote. As a result of this incident, and after meeting with Scipio, the two chieftains abandoned the Carthaginians and sided with the Romans. They quickly concluded a treaty with Rome. The treaty was extremely beneficial to the Romans, since most of the tribal territories in Iberia were loyal to these two chieftains. Meanwhile, the three main Carthaginian commanders in Iberia were still deeply divided, even after the fall of New Carthage. Scipio realized he was now in a position where he could pick off each army one by one. His first target would be Hesdrubal Barca, who had wintered at Bacula. So in the spring of 208 BC, he left Taraco with his army and marched straight towards Hesdrubal. Scipio's army checked in at 30,000 Roman troops and 10,000 Spanish soldiers. Scipio received a warm reception from every tribe he approached, so much so that each tribe provided him with guides to navigate through the frontiers. Hasdrubal Barca was aware of the perils facing him, and used his time wisely. Polybius writes, quote, The prospect of Scipio's arrival also caused him much anxiety. Expecting him as he did to be soon on the spot with his army, and seeing himself deserted by the Iberians, who all with one accord were joining the Romans, he more or less decided on the following course. He proposed to make all possible preparations and meet the enemy in battle. Should fortune give him victory, he would afterwards deliberate in security as to his future action. But if he met with a reverse in battle, he would retreat from the field with the survivors to Gaul, and getting as many of the natives as he could to join him through a pass into Italy, and throw into his fortunes with his brother Hannibal. End quote. Hasdrubal took steps to put his army in a strong defensive position. Polybius writes, quote, On hearing of the arrival of the Romans, he shifted his camp to a position where he had in his rear the effective protection of a river, and in his front a stretch of level ground defended by a ridge and of sufficient depth for safety and sufficient width for deploying his troops. Here he remained, stationing his covering force on the ridge in front of him, end quote. After Scipio set up his camp, he was unsure how to attack such a formidable position. But after remaining in camp for two days, Scipio became concerned that the other two Carthaginian armies might make an appearance. In that event, he might well find his camp surrounded by the enemy on all sides. He decided he needed to launch an attack against Hasdrubal on the third day. To open the battle, Scipio sent a skirmishing force up the ridge to the position where Hasdrubal had deployed his light infantry. To the surprise of Hasdrubal, the Romans pushed back his light infantry. Scipio wasted no time and dispatched his heavy infantry to attack the wings of the Carthaginian formation. Gaius Lilius attacked on the right flank, while Scipio attacked the left side. Hasdrubal was slow to react to the suddenness of the Roman charge, and failed to deploy the rest of his forces in a timely fashion. Now he effectively found himself trapped near the entrance of his camp. Hasdrubal made the decision to evacuate, 
and successfully retreated from his camp with the treasury, elephants, and his remaining forces. He then marched his army towards the Pyrenees with the intent of crossing the Alps and making his way into Italy. Scipio decided it would be dangerous to pursue Hasdrubal, should the other two armies in Iberia link up with him. As it turned out, this was not an issue, since Mago handed over control of his army to Hasdrubal. He then went on a mission to recruit new mercenary replacements overseas. In addition, Hasdrubal Gisco's army retreated further to the west, in order to avoid all contact with Scipio. Back in Rome, Marcellus and Crispinus were the confirmed Roman consuls for the year 208 BC. But the elections were not without controversy. Some in the Roman Senate were displeased with the losses Marcellus had suffered against Hannibal at Canusium. This had allowed Hannibal to march uncontested throughout southern Italy. Marcellus returned to Rome to confront these allegations. Livy indicates that, quote, the tribune of the plebs attacked not only Marcellus, but against the nobility as a whole. It was due to their crooked policy and lack of energy, he said, that Hannibal had for ten years been holding Italy as his province. He had in fact passed more of his life here than in Carthage. Marcellus's army, after its double defeat, was now passing the summer comfortably housed in Venusia. Marcellus made such a crushing reply to the Tribune's speech by simply recounting all that he had done that not only was the proposal to deprive him of his command rejected, but the next day all the centuries unanimously elected him consul. End quote. Another debate arose in the Senate in terms of how to deal with the citizens of Tarentum. Livy writes, quote, Fabius was present and stood up for those whom he had subjugated. Others took the opposite line. The majority regarded their guilt as equal to that of Capua, and deserving equally severe punishment. At last a resolution was adopted that the town should be garrisoned, and the entire population confined within their walls until Italy was in a less disturbed state. Then the whole question could be reconsidered, end quote. The Senate also discussed the performance of the commander who had lost Tarentum to Hannibal. Some senators wanted to censure him for his negligence in allowing Hannibal to capture the city through treachery. Others, however, thought the commander should be rewarded for having defended the citadel for years without adequate reinforcements. In the end, the Senate asked the censors to decide the commander's innocence or guilt in this matter. After the Senate proceedings were concluded, Marcellus and Crispinus prepared for the summer campaign season. It was decided that both consuls would remain in Italy. In Sicily, Valerius Lavinus was provided with a fleet of 100 ships. He was instructed to raid the African coastline, especially if he thought the conditions were sufficient. Similar to the previous year, 21 legions were tasked to carry on the war against Carthage. Soon Marcellus departed Rome and took command of his army at Venusium. Crispinus joined him, combining both consular armies. Hannibal camped close to Venusium, but decided it wise not to confront both consular armies at once. Both sides seemed content to limit their operations to minor skirmishes. Hannibal also spent time scouting for positions that might be suitable for an ambush. The consuls decided to put some pressure on Hannibal and ordered part of the garrison at Tarentum to march to Locri and assist with an ongoing siege against that city. However, Hannibal received intelligence of Rome's intentions. He dispatched a force of 3,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry to intercept the Romans along the road from Tarentum. The Roman troops failed to adequately scout the area and fell right into Hannibal's trap. 2,000 Romans were killed and another 1,500 were captured. The survivors fled back to Tarentum. Meanwhile, near Venusium, Hannibal noticed a wooded hill that was perfect for another ambush. The hill was situated between the Carthaginian and Roman camps. Since the Romans had not yet occupied it, Hannibal dispatched some Numidians to establish a position and conceal themselves in the woods. They remained there in utter silence. Therefore, the Romans remained completely unaware of their existence. Soon, Roman scouts also took notice of the hill and informed Marcellus of its importance. Marcellus actually thought it might make a perfect spot to move his camp. Livy writes that, quote, Marcellus was seized with such a keen desire of engaging Hannibal that he never thought that their respective camps were near enough to each other, end quote. Marcellus then said, quote, Why do we not go with a few horsemen and examine the place? When we have seen it for ourselves, we shall know what better to do, end quote. Crispinus agreed and they set off with 220 cavalry. As Marcellus and his contingent made their way up the hill, they were spotted by a Numidian lookout. 
The Numidians waited until the last moment so that there would be no possible escape for the Roman consuls. They also surreptitiously maneuvered some cavalry to the bottom of the hill. Livy writes, quote, Then the Numidians sprang up on all sides, and with a loud shout charged down. The consuls were hemmed in, unable to force their way to the hill which was occupied, and with a retreat cut off by those in their rear. Still, the conflict might have kept up for a longer time if the Etruscans, who were the first to flee, had not created a panic among the rest. The Fragellans, however, though abandoned by the Etruscans, maintained the conflict as long as the consuls were unwounded and able to cheer them on and take their part in the fighting. But when both consuls were wounded, and when they saw Marcellus fall dying from his horse, run through with a lance, then the little band of survivors fled in company with Crispinus who had been hit by two darts, end quote. Although Crispinus was able to escape, he would later succumb to the injuries he had suffered during the battle. Hannibal, emboldened by the death of Marcellus and the severe injuries dealt to Crispinus, moved his camp to the hill where the fight had just taken place. Hannibal allowed Marcellus a proper funeral, and even sent his ashes back to Marcellus's son in a silver urn. The loss of Marcellus was a major blow to Roman morale, as the Republic had lost one of its finest commanders, Marcellus, along with Fabius Maximus, were the first Roman generals to develop a comprehensive plan to deal with Hannibal. Fabius came up with the strategy, while Marcellus was the great executor of that plan. He had fought Hannibal to a standstill several times, only being defeated decisively one time. After Marcellus's death, Crispinus retired to the Roman camp. Livy writes, quote, Crispinus, unnerved by the death of his colleague and his own wound, left his position in the dead of the night and fixed his camp on the first mountains he came to, in a lofty position protected on every side. Once his camp was fortified, Crispinus dispatched messengers to several nearby cities that Marcellus had been killed in combat, and not to trust any directives issued in the name of the dead consul. Crispinus's fears were not at all unfounded, as Hannibal had in fact taken possession of Marcellus's signet ring. And sure enough, Hannibal, never one to pass up on a ruse, dispatched messages to Salopia in the name of Marcellus. He stated that he would arrive in Salapia soon, and the garrison should be ready in case he needed them to march. Salapia, however, was already aware that Marcellus had been killed, and sent the messenger back to Hannibal without revealing they were aware of the ruse. The city was held in a high state of readiness. The best soldiers were placed at the gate. Patrols and sentries were strengthened in case Hannibal decided to make an appearance. On cue, Hannibal approached the city later that night. Hannibal placed Roman deserters at the head of the column. They wore Roman armor and spoke Latin. When they reached the city's outer walls, they ordered the sentinels to open the gate, stating the consul had arrived. Livy writes what happened next. Quote, the sentinels, pretending to be just awakened up, bustled about in hurry and confusion and began slowly opening the gate. It was closed by a portcullis, and by means of levers and ropes, they raised it just high enough for a man to pass upright under it. The passage was hardly sufficiently clear when the deserters rushed through the gate each trying to be the first man through. About 600 were inside, when suddenly the rope which held it was let go, and the portcullis fell with a great crash. The Salopians attacked the deserters, who were marching carelessly along with their shields hung from their shoulders, as though friends. Others on the gate tower and the walls kept off the enemy outside with stones and long poles and javelins. So Hannibal, finding himself caught in his own trap, drew off and proceeded to raise the siege of Locri, end quote. The siege of Locri had been going on for several months. Hannibal had previously defeated the reinforcements that had been dispatched from Tarentum to assist in the attack. But now Hannibal was determined to raise the siege altogether before the city fell. He dispatched his Numidian cavalry in advance. The Romans had received word of Hannibal's approach, and as the Numidians appeared on the horizon, the Romans abandoned their siege equipment and fled to their nearby ships. Thus, without even so much as a fight, Hannibal had raised the siege of Locri. Meanwhile, despite his grave wounds, Crispinus continued to issue commands. He ordered the army Marcellus had commanded back to Venusia. Crispinus then headed for Capua. After he arrived at Capua, he dispatched a letter to the Senate informing them of Marcellus's death. Crispinus also indicated that he could go no further than Capua, owing to the seriousness of his wounds. He also explained that he was concerned about Tarentum, especially if Hannibal decided to march out of Brutium. The Senate was greatly saddened to hear of the dire turn of events. They dispatched several senators to Capua so that they might confer with Crispinus. Once there, it became clear that Crispinus would be unable to return to Rome in order to conduct new elections. They asked the consul to nominate a dictator. Once the dictator was nominated, 
the dictator's main duty would be to conduct the elections for next year's consuls. Crispinus would die from his wounds a short time later. We will continue on with the year 207 BC in the next video.